better job. Now, so we went to a high school uh, in, uh, in Nashville. It's very well funded, private school, and said if anyone in the city will have this. And uh, we looked at their book, and it had uh, less than 45 words about the 45 words of the First Amendment. <laughs> two, two pages interesting on the phenomenon of the American shopping mall, uh, <laughs> but uh, less than 45 words. We know, looking at, at the course of, of uh, and in a case that touched Iowa, in terms of Tinker, where three young people wore black armbands with a peace symbol on them to symbolize their concern for the dead on all sides in the Vietnam War. And that established a principle in law, quickly summarized by, by I think one of the comments at the time that school children don't leave their rights at the schoolhouse door. I'm fond of adding my own corollaries to these things. Uh, there were other decisions, however, in the interim, Frazier and Hazelwood, which I think have produced an atmosphere in American high schools in which, while you may not lose your rights at the schoolhouse door, I say you park them at the principal's office for four years and you, and you pick them up on your way out with your diploma. Because we don't teach by example. Our high schools often, in many places in America, are more concerned with protecting the image of the school and under the doctrine of preserving the ed orderly educational process, they give wide latitudes. The courts give wide latitude to administrators who are all too eager to take up that, that uh, club to shut down and restrain speech in its facets, print and spoken and t-shirts and what have you in public schools. Now, my wife is a first grade teacher. I have a great appreciation for the difficulty of educators in, in an orderly educational process in maintaining that and achieving it. I, I believe me, I, I hear that a lot. But I think we have a situation now in which we neither teach the First Amendment through the books and the classes, nor do we teach it by example. And then why are we surprised that when as adults there is not an appreciation, a support, a protest when information is restricted, we have done a very good job of educating our young people. And that is my concern for the future, that these five challenges in a society that does not seem willing or eager to tackle the complexity of modern life when it comes to our own freedoms and takes them for granted. I'll leave you with just one story that, if I may, um, happened outside the United States where, was, as it was pointed out, we have, there is no First Amendment. It's unique to the United States, but I was a visitor in, in East Berlin before the wall fell. I was on a tour with some young military journalists who I'd gone over to lecture about military newspapers. And we went to, if there's anyone here from Germany or East Germany, it's, uh, as I recall it, this is almost now 30 years ago, uh, to where uh, uh, the, behind the State Opera House there was, a, there was the only open church, as it was described to me, in East Berlin. And we had been touring some of the real jewels of culture in Berlin, East Berlin, the opera house and museums, and it was quite stunning. And we went to this church, and we had a West German man who was a guide. We went in, and there was a lady dusting. And uh, we were, uh, you know, we were in our 20s, and a lot of us, our mind was on, as I was saying, you know, at one point, uh, sort of on uh, the bar and where we were going later and the museums we'd seen and uh, we were going to a church probably wasn't our first choice. And the tour was essentially, this is the front of the church, these are the two sides, that's the back. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> so being the age we were, on the way back out to the little bus and on the bus, we were making a little fun of this. And our guide, who it turned out had been a uh, was old enough to have served in the German army, but then worked for the occupation forces for the rest of his career. Um, I will always remember there was a little bar as you walked up to the bus, and he went like that, and he said, you do not understand what you've seen. And he introduced me to an incredible human being. This woman, in order to work in the church, could not ride public transportation. She could not, uh, uh, her, her children could not be in the Young Pioneers, which was kind of a quasi-Boy Scout military deal, but you had to be in that to, to go forward. Denied the access to higher education. Her husband could not find employment. 
They lived in the worst possible state housing there was. And it went on and on. And I, I will tell you, we were so sort of stunned and embarrassed, we did two things. One, we piled off and put a lot of Eastmarks in the collection box. But it took me almost three years to think about what I had seen. That I had seen what had to be the closest equivalent I'll ever meet to our founding fathers or someone who had actually stood up for freedom in a way I would never be compelled, at least I thought at the time, as an American, to stand up for the freedoms that I have. This was, this, I've, I was fortunate in my career to cover presidential campaigns, to cover lots of people who I admire. I have never met a better example of the power of the First Amendment in this country and with the protection of it, the majesty of the First Amendment than that simple woman who was dusting and touring, giving tours for 10 seconds in that church in Germany of all places. We do not live in a culture that encourages the future of the First Amendment. Now, all is not lost. All is not lost. Our same survey shows that Americans do have a reverence for um, the ideals of the First Amendment, the disconnect is in the practice. We have to educate our citizens about this. We have to start in the high schools. Thank you. We have about, well, about 10 minutes, and I would like for uh, I'd like for anybody who wants to ask a question of any member of the panel, including uh, Dr. Boucher, uh, can you come to the middle? Use this microphone. In fact, Drew, can you make sure that microphone is on? That way everybody will hear what you have to say. And I think we're being recorded, right? So uh, it would be nice to... Uh, while, while he's coming to the microphone, let me, let me mention one historical fact sort of adding to, to, a, to a martyr for freedom. On Thursday, we will be, I don't think the right word, celebrating, but we'll be remembering the, the 140th anniversary of the one American president who paid the ultimate price for freedom, Abraham Lincoln. Now, the irony of that is, especially for me as a scholar of Midwest Democrats in the Civil War, is he put 13,500 people in jail as political prisoners in the Civil War. But he also freed the slaves. He freed the black people in the South. And John Wilkes Booth killed him because of that, that Southern, that Southern way of life. Anyway, I think, I think we have to remember you know, the, these things like this, as well as the woman in East Berlin, because there is a tremendous price paid that we take these things for granted. Go so, ahead. Uh, you mentioned uh, doing a, a check in, in 53 and the current check on, on a couple of texts. I just wonder if there's any comprehensive data about the historical trend in terms of emphasis on education in this area. I don't think this mic is on, is it? Yeah, we're here. We heard you. Okay. <clears throat> We, uh, we looked at those two books in preparation for a particular program, uh, but I think there's no question. I, did, I took a sabbatical. We get a sabbatical, uh, even though we're not really a university operation, but they give us one. It's great. I, I was foolish enough not to lay in the beach, but I went to work at Paul State, the <laughs> University of my alma mater, for three months. Uh, and we looked at high school education and journalism and high school education and First Amendment. And so I have kind of an anecdotal, but a, but a three-month intensive anecdotal experience on this. Uh, the Knight Foundation found out, found example that the, the, the tendency not to teach journalism, which is I, I kind of call the lost leader for the First Amendment, it's where we most experience, most of us touch the First Amendment. Uh, the pace of removing that from high schools, for example, is accelerating. Of the programs that have dropped uh, journalism, 40% of them have done it in the last five years. Um, in high schools and districts. Uh, the pace of not teaching about this is, has just uh, accelerated. 
So I, I, I couldn't tell you X number of things or textbook review, but I can tell you the, all the anecdotal evidence we can find says that, that, that we don't and it, the tendency not is accelerating. And, and, uh, and, and again, for the future, it's just a terrible uh, indicator. Well, I, th there is a, some, um, it, all is not lost. I mean, uh, the Freedom Forum itself has, a, has an education program in the schools. And it, but it's small. I mean, it just doesn't reach enough schools. But at least there is a kernel of education. Um, and there are other education programs that we are developing and, it, and that we are moving into the schools, but it's almost a drop in the bucket when we need a deluge in lots of buckets. So it's, you know, you keep trying. So. After five years, we'll have 20 schools in our first amendment school program. There are well, 16,000 high schools alone. Though. Yeah, These are it, high school, middle, and elementary. It's, um, yeah, it's slow. I mean, it takes money, and that's why. Why is that? Because so you don't get the information out and they don't respond. Well, we. We spend a lot of money putting it out, uh, but it, it, uh, it, you know, it's an unwillingness in some cases to even consider it, frankly. Uh, and then, uh, you know, your criteria goes beyond a journalism program. It's also your students have free speech, your student government free to debate certain issues. You know, it, frankly, it's a pretty tough criteria to uh, to meet as well. Yeah, it's, it's uh, particularly, yeah, both co campaign contributions and contributions to so-called independent groups. And it is a very complex question, I think. The, um, and I think it's moving in the wrong direction, personally. That moving in the direction of attempting to restrict the supply of money uh, ultimately doesn't work because the money always reaches a different uh, you know, finds a new way. I actually think we should be doing something much more radical than that. Um, and I think that in a lot of ways we do have a political system that is very skewed by wealth. And you see it at worst in things like referendum on, you know, uh, public policy questions in California or on should we have public power in San Francisco. The corporate interests spend Two, and there lies $2.6 million, and there's $80,000 on the other side. So are people getting diverse information from different sources? And you can repeat that story again and again, or the McCain tobacco bill. Huge amounts of money spent on one side, no, all sorts of TV advertising, almost nothing on the television stations that are getting the millions of dollars, giving any sort of critical analysis of the propaganda they're broadcasting and nothing on the other side. The point is, is the problem isn't that, you know, the tobacco people get to speak. It's that we have this one-sided, heavily propagandized system. So I, what I would do, there were problems with the fairness doctrine. The fairness doctrine was the idea that you had to have both sides. And there were a lot of problems with it. But I think you could have a limited sort of fairness doctrine in which you required free time on television, radio, cable, you might have to amend the Constitution to do it for presidential candidates, candidates for Congress, so on, 
So you, you could increase the supply that way. You could say that, fine, you can carry these ex tremendously expensive ads for the people who have all the money, but you have to give 25% free time to the other side. If you do it carefully enough, I think you could actually open more of a forum for free speech than restrict it. But I think that the, the other system really just does not have a good track record of working very well, and there are potential problems with it. Because to some extent, people contributing money to, uh, you know, whether it's moveon.org or the Right to Life group or some other group, are expressing ideas. But really, the idea that we have a system in this country in which access is so heavily dependent on money and one side is often heard in the debate and the other side isn't heard in the debate, is a scandal. And if you were designing a democratic system from scratch, I don't think that's the sort of system you ought to, uh, you ought to uh, uh, design. I've been thinking critically, Gina, about your comment on critical thinking. <laughs> Took me a while to... I just, I just have to think about it a while. And the thought occurred um, that there's an oxymoron in the multitasking critical thinker. And there is a lot of multitasking going on with technology, with education, with journalism. Um, I talked to a professor at the University of Missouri, and she said that one of the problems that we have in, in corporate media is that they forget that people at the university, some of us, still have time to think. That they for, forget that we also have empirical data. We also, they also forget that we can provide it for free. They don't have to pay oh, consultants large sums of money to tell them certain basic things. And I think that it is becoming increasingly difficult to teach critical thinking. And we talk about critical thinking primarily because we've read books. And the library, of course, has been key in that book culture. I'm not sure, and I could be wrong. I don't have a definitive stance on this. I just don't know. I'm ignorant and fearful. But I'm not apathetic. <laughs> that if you do not read and you are inundated with media messages from a variety of places with cell phones pinging in your pocket and Eudora's chiming in the, in the back, how does one critically think? And yet that's the most important thing that I think educators and journalists can do. One of my colleagues said, that the silence of the library was distinctly of my generation and that it would be hell, pure hell, for younger people to have that silence. But I don't know how one teaches critical thinking without meditation. I'm stumped. Do you want Yeah, I, I think one other thing. There are movements on campaign finance, such as public finance of campaigns. One, and the studies show that where you have public finance, you have many more competitive elections. You have more people running than you had before. You have a greater group of people running before. Part of the objection to public finance is that, well, you know, I don't want to be required to finance, you know, ideas with which I disagree. Well, you know, the truth is, folks, you're already doing it. You know, if you have to buy drugs, you know, the money that goes to the drug company is being used to finance political ideas with which you may disagree. If you have to buy all sorts of products, this money is being diverted to political purposes for things with which you may disagree. You know, I, I use charge cards. If you use charge cards, you're dealing with the charge cards companies. You are financing a campaign to privatize Social Security, which 
if you agree with me, you think is, you know, a terrible idea. But what's the option if all the charge card companies are doing it? So one problem is that basically because campaigns are so expensive and the expense is heavily television time, and because candidates have to get money from people who have it, we have a restricted uh, debate because candidates can't argue about things which will discourage the big donors from giving the big money you have to have on to get on TV. So to some extent, we have sort of a wealth primary that is limiting the democratic process. Um, it, it, I think what's been said before does frame the argument that you're really f talking about a Restraint on speech, which I, I think writing a check is speech. I, you know, I'm just, I will give you my personal view. I think that writing a check is another way, carrying a sign, marching, standing up, voting. To me, they are all expressions. Uh, weigh that against the potential for money to, to dominate the system. My night to quote Churchill, Churchill once was asked metaphorically if uh, how he, how he would feel if, if uh, Hitler were to invade Hades. And he so hated Hitler that he said he would feel compelled to stand in the House of Commons and deliver a lukewarm defense of the Prince of Darkness. Uh, I think that's unfortunately the choice we have in this issue, uh, is the potential for money to dominate and, and distort the political argument versus a restraint on, to me of a very fundamental principle in which I may express my view and support a candidate uh, and, and, and have these basic liberties unfettered. So I, I'm willing to risk uh, the, the lukewarm defense of the Prince of Darkness, this idea the government might be, the, the debate may be twisted by money, I think in preserving the right of an individual to express themselves in many fashions. And we express ourselves in music, we express ourselves in books and speech and by standing and holding a sign, sometimes being mute. There was a protest that's still going on, I think, in a church in Washington by parishioners who stand mute during mass, the entire mass. It has to do with the debate for how the particular church was being run. And those are so fundamental to me that I think the, the potential danger of the money impact in our government structure and debate is, is a, a sufferance. Uh, and, I, and I think any attempt to restrain it, I think, is, a, is an unconscionable restraint on our liberty. I'm not going to add to that debate at all, except to say this. The last poor guy to be president died 140 years ago this Thursday. Who else has got a question? We have here a professor who taught a course in theory, but he's so shy. Well, it's easy to grandstand. jobs they might best qualify for, and he was using astrology charts and so forth. And these were four credit courses. And by four credit, I mean fur credit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was a wildly popular profession. So uh, to make a long story short, I, I challenged him. And uh, the story broke here, and it made it And so there was a committee that wanted to have seminars in those days. And so we volunteered, not that we were going to run this seminar and argue with each other if one of the students was going to do. Well, Dave didn't want to be part of it. So we had two, of course. And, and I didn't want to just focus on his things because, as you pointed out here, you know, there was the whole business of Madison Avenue. And my thought was, critical thing who doesn't have a chance because there are so many institutions that can't afford to have a critical thinking public. Religion, <laughs> politicians, Madison Avenue, and you could go right down the line. So I wanted to broaden this thing out. Everything was fine, except that there were some evangelicals in the class that were taking it not for credit, but just to sort of watchdogs. 
and they were creationists. And when I got to the religion part, my approach to teaching critical thinking is to develop the knack for inverting exactly the popular, whatever the popular position, invert it and see if you can't find some surreptitious way to give a compelling argument to the other side. And so I wrote an essay to demonstrate this called Evangelist God and You, and it took the position that Satan wrote the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and I picked out all the contradictions and uh, some of the, the horrendous crimes that are in the Bible and so forth. And, and I said, Satan put these in God's mouth. Uh, you know, to argue that, well, off the kids went that were not in the class, but were uh, taking it just for the hell of it. And he went to the, the dean of my college. And he petitioned the committee to have the course asked. And the course was asked. Uh, he wrote a memo. I, uh, the woman that ran the program said, look, uh, would you like to see the memo? And I said, no, I'd rather ask the dean for it. So I asked the dean, and he refused to give it. And the issue of the subject. Wise guy here decides to do a program, uh, some kind of a study on this later and, and reveal the thing. And he went over to get the memo. No longer did the woman that ran the committee have the memo. Boylan didn't have the memo anymore. This is the dean of the College of Engineering, who, by the way, was a 5,000 year creationist. And I'm not. And so, uh, so, you know. What do you say? I mean, this, these, these kind of things happen. But uh, at least uh, my view was to be incendiary then. At, once that happened, they, they were able to shut me up. And so I'm, I'm a pest, uh, a pariah on campus. Uh, there was a blackboard over here today, and a, and a whiteboard, Mark and Benz, and they had, tell you for your thoughts, um, what, uh, yeah, I think Jesus is. So I put an urban legend, John W. Patterson. You know, and uh, I think that the, that the best, I think that rather than shrinking away from these things, you can get a lot of educational value by going right to the heart of the matter and fighting as hard as you can. And what the hell, uh, I'm, I'm still here. You know, this was, this was what, 20, 30 years ago. And the dean is gone. Well, I'm retired too. But, <laughs> but you know, I mean, so, and, and yet I wind up being uh, not liked by a lot of people because I've become a rather dedicated atheist and an outspoken one. And if you ever want to experience the, the tyranny of the majority, be an atheist for a while. <laughs> Yeah, I like the rhetorical analysis class that they have here at Iowa State. One of the things that they did with, with these logic classes in English is there is so much information and the books are excellent. And so if in high schools they have that vocabulary and that example that is given to them so it gives them time to understand all these different styles of analyzing. And like in your case, uh, it's easy to be emotional. And yeah. rather than logical. And you should have just told them, you know, it wasn't fair to you in a way because you're trying to develop logic in them and you should be able to say, it's easy to be emotional. I didn't have one chance. That's not fair because they're not the way Yeah, but I mean, this one, I, I didn't realize that this one came over to the dean and uh, that was the end of it. I didn't have a chance to come with Well, it's past nine. Um, I appreciate everybody coming out and spending two hours listening to our outstanding panelists and Dr. Boucher too. And I want to mention that tomorrow night we will have, it's in the sunroom, is that right? <laughs> in, I believe that's right. In the sunroom at 7 o'clock we will be talking about uh, petition, the forgotten freedom. And we have three different groups again tomorrow night speaking and um, I think you'll enjoy that and then Wednesday night we actually have the tinkers that we referred to earlier 
uh, coming, or at least uh, Mary Beth and John Tinker, the other person, uh, Mr. Eckhart, is not coming. And we'll be talking about the 1969 Supreme Court, Tinker versus Des Moines. On Thursday, we're going to try to set a record for the most people simultaneously reading uh, a, uh, a speech. It's actually part of John F. Kennedy's inaugural address. And then on Friday, we'll have our little religious free-for-all. We appreciate everything. First of all, I want to mention two people before we leave. Mark Witherspoon, who is the chairman of the First Amendment Week. And standing right next to him is Joella Kemp, who's in charge of about everything else that Mark's not in charge of this week. And also, uh, did Kate already leave? Kate Llewellyn already leave? She's our... PR person, and she's done a heck of a job of getting the word out in the community. Uh, I counted about 50 people here tonight, which is uh, 50 people who I assume are not apathetic. So I appreciate your coming. Uh, again, Dr. Uh, Curtis's book is available in the back, uh, and uh, we have T-shirts, which are on sale for $5, and we uh, hope to see many of you out here again uh, tomorrow night. Uh, I don't think there's quite as much competition with the Da Vinci Code tomorrow night. But uh, thank you so much for coming, and uh, go out and scream at the moon. Thank you. <laughs>